I'm flying across an ocean of sand mixed with bitumen. From up here, it looks like an industrial wasteland. But for some, it's the key to the future of the Canadian economy, and it could provide decades of secure energy to North America. They saw this oil sands and really, literally, it was on the ground. They were walking up there and people were finding the oil because it was so close to the surface and wondering how they could then capitalize on this and turn it into a useful commodity. It wasn't long before the technology developed to separate the oil from the sand. Today, the oil sands industry produces around 2 million barrels a day, and business is now booming at sites like this. We were producing about 12,000 barrels. That was five years ago. Today, we're producing about 135,000 barrels. And this is the finished product but the process releases three times the greenhouse gases generated by conventional oil extraction. There is a town in North Ontario. The oil sands bonanza has attracted some vehement opponents. Legendary rock star Neil Young is one of them. It is the ugliest environmental disaster that that I not only have ever seen, but that I could even comprehend. The Alberta oil sands surround the Athabasca River north of the state capital, Edmonton. There are 900 residents in the small community of Fort Mackay. The stacks of Syncrude and Suncor, two of the largest oil sands companies, loom large over the frozen landscape. And what do you call this area? Um, we call it the 900 block, also known as Beverly Hills. Jim Boucher is the chief of the local indigenous people, the Fort Mackay First Nation. All houses from now on will be built to the standard. Fort Mackay is held up as a fine example of good relations between oil sands companies and local people. We're benefiting more from, from uh, these relationships. Our community now has uh, no unemployment. Uh, we have uh, probably around eight different corporations actively engaged in the business. We gross out of probably around six to seven hundred million dollars a year. But the newfound wealth has come at a cost. The sad thing is that we have to generate our revenues from economic activity that really virtually destroys the land. And uh, we're not in the position at this point in time to stop it. Fort Mackay is surrounded by open pit mines. Vast areas of forest have been cleared and layers of peat and clay peeled back to remove the bitumen close to the surface. Tailings ponds like this one are scattered across the landscape. In total, they cover more than 170 square kilometres. The industry hasn't been able to demonstrate how to clean these up, so they're a liability, a toxic liability that continues to grow. Simon Dyer is a director at the Pembina Institute, a Canadian NGO that advocates for sustainable energy. Those tailings ponds include, of course, wastewater and sand. They also include about 10% residual bitumen from the extraction process and solvents used in the extraction process. And so they're also a, a significant source of uh, local air pollutants, volatile organic compounds and methane. It used to be our food basket. Now it's a river uh, recreation. That's, that's all it is. Do people drink the water? People can't drink the water, well, not unless, of course, you put it through a, a process, a water treatment process. A recent government report confirmed what has long been suspected, that the tailings ponds are leaching into the groundwater and seeping into the river system. Pamina doesn't do research on health impacts, so I have no specific data about this. There have been conflicting studies. Uh, some say that there's an elevated uh, um, cancer risk downstream of the oil sands. Others say that there is no uh, elevated uh, uh, risk. The causality of that is unknown at this point, but it's, it's clear there are unanswered questions and there's a growing pollution problem. Right here, this row here is steam generation. 
At this operation, run by the Canadian company Synovus, there are no tailings ponds. No digging, we simply drill. That allows us to access a large underground reservoir with very little ground disturbance. It's a process known as in situ and is hailed by the industry as more environmentally friendly. But there's a serious drawback. It uses steam, a lot of steam. We're injecting steam deep down underground to soften the oil. It's actually more greenhouse gas intensive than the mining process. So the greenhouse gas profile of the industry as a whole is actually starting to worsen because of the greater um, deployment of in situ expansions. A hundred and fifty kilometres north of Fort Mackay is the fishing hamlet of Fort Chipwan, one of the oldest settlements in Alberta. On the shores of Lake Athabasca, abandoned boats are everywhere, and not just because it's winter. We can't fish because we don't want to hurt people. We don't know how much and all chemicals there is in those, those things. Ray Latticer fished on the lake for more than 50 years. He's in no doubt that the oil sands operations downstream are poisoning the water. The last 40 years or so they've been discharging deadly chemicals and they're denying it. Back at home, Ray Latticer shows me photographs of deformed fish he's caught. The fish are getting deformed the last 20 some years, you know, getting worse and worse. The pickerel, they're deformed, they're humpbacks, pusting faces, bulge out eyes, crooked tails, belly deformed and they're breaking out and lumps on them. And how often would you come across a fish like that? A big volume of fish comes in the, into our plant. And you get one time we took over 200 pounds in a couple of days there of deformed fish. With a population of just 1,100 people, word spreads quickly in Fort Chippewan, and so too does fear. The people in Fort Chippewan don't fish anymore. They don't want to eat the fish. They no longer drink the water. What responsibility does the industry take for their situation? The, what they choose to eat and what they choose to drink is their choice. If there are lakes that say that they're getting above human health contamination, none of that's been found. So you're completely confident that with the people of Fort Chippewayan that their belief that they're getting sick because of the oil sands is completely unfounded? From an industry, I'm not a medical expert, I can't answer that question, but we want the science to be able to be there to answer that question. Two recent government reviews of cancer data for Fort Chippewan revealed heightened levels for an extremely rare and deadly cancer. In the past decade, there have been five cases of bile duct cancer in this town's tiny population. The most recent is Chaddy's restaurant owner and local councillor, John Chaddy. Not an easy cancer to diagnose, it took his doctors some time to confirm their suspicions. The question I posed to him was, you know, I need you to be perfectly frank and totally blunt. I, I need to know what's going on here. I mean, it's been a little over three weeks and I still haven't, no one's really told me anything. And, and just that in itself, the weight of that in itself was, uh, if it wasn't affecting me as much as it should have, it was affecting my family. My wife, who is a rock. Uh, it's not the first time John Chaddy's wife, Clarice Voyager, has supported a family member in their fight against this aggressive cancer. For me, this is the second bile duct cancer in my family. My uncle died nine years ago with the same thing, so to me, that like when John started feeling sick, like the symptoms, I, you know, brought back memories of my uncle and it, it hurts, like, you know, it hurts to see the small community of Fort Chip with all this cancer and, you know, and the government lying, saying it's, you know, it's nothing. 
Alrighty, let's do this. Way back in the mid-2000s, Dr John O'Connor was so concerned about the number of bile duct cancers he was seeing in the Fort Chippewan community, he went to the health authorities. He wasn't prepared for the response he got. I was attacked, I, I was victimised, I was, um, you know, there was a concerted effort made to, to take away my medical licence. And, you know, with their, with their efforts to do that, it, it could have, you know, I don't know how close it came to succeeding. The government's health, energy and environment departments all declined Dateline's request for interviews about community health fears. People outside are shocked. And yet the silence is deafening from both provincial and federal government departments. The public health physicians should be all over this. If I'm concerned as a family physician that this is a, causing a, a problem, maybe causing a problem, they, they should be like climbing the walls trying to get at it. Riding his dog sled through the Fort Chippewan woods, Robert Granjam is the picture-perfect Albertan. But these days he's a rarity amongst the First Nation people. I'm still tr very traditional in my teachings of uh, my traditional upbringing as, as an Aboriginal uh, First, I guess First Nation. Uh, so I do hunt and trap. I fish off the land. Come on, dogs! The First Nation are the traditional owners of the land here, and they're guaranteed by law the right to hunt and fish. But it's a way of life that's increasingly limited by the spread of the oil sands operations. Do you worry that the oil sands could threaten your lifestyle? I think it can threaten everybody's lifestyle in a sense that not only myself, but I do, I am worried, you know, for generations down, down the road that, you know, they're not going to have the opportunity that I've grown up with. So if this is going to be taken away, it's not going to ever be, re, you know, rejuvenated again to its natural state, you know. The Athabasca Fort Chippewan First Nation is gearing up for a legal battle against oil sands operations encroaching on their traditional land. The First Nation chief, Alan Adam, takes a hard line against the development, comparing it to an act of genocide. Every time we approve a project is that we're killing our people softly. Don't give in to government and don't give in to industry when they're going to have adverse effects to your well-being because your future generations people are at stake. We won't, and that's why we continue to fight. But for many of those who work in the oil sands industry, it's a different story. The main oil sands centre is Fort McMurray, known locally as Fort McMoney. People flock here from all over Canada looking for jobs, with a dream of making it rich. A shortage of accommodation has seen house prices skyrocket, and trailer parks like this one have sprung up on the outskirts of the town. It's hard to find anyone here who has anything bad to say about the industry. If there was no oil sands here, there'd be an awful lot of hungry people in every province, because this is where the most work is and you have the work to survive. A couple of trailers away, a woman tells me how the industry is giving her stepson a future. He loves the team that he works with. He feels that he's safe and, and taken care of. Um, he doesn't feel he's doing anything wrong. He works in, he's an electrical apprentice and he's gonna have the opportunity to complete that apprenticeship here. The companies make enough money to sponsor him. These two young women from Ontario are moving into the trailer park today. I'm not going anywhere. This town, I love the feel of it. I love the job. I, I love the oil sands. Yeah. I think it's great. It's a wonderful place to live. Yeah. As for any criticism of the industry's environmental record, they're not concerned. It is bad for the environment, but at the same time, the world needs it and it's good for the Canadian economy. Yeah. 
clearly the way development is currently occurring is, is not responsible and we need to have much higher environmental standards, uh, much better performance from the companies, but also Canadians uh, and Albertans, we need to have a discussion about what level of oil sands development is appropriate and there's such a thing as too much oil sands development. I don't think that that's happening in the discourse in Canada right now.